to either decrease their emissions or fully decarbonize. Uh, shareholders, insurance companies, institutional investors, as you all know, have been raising the pressure to align the corporate strategies with the climate reality. I mean, we, we are, we are, that's something that we have to, to deal with. So one of my favorite graphics from the, the BP's energy outlook shows how, how long it, it, it takes for energy transitions to occur. And uh, our common friend Spencer Dale likes to remind us with his uh, dotted line that uh, you probably don't see here, but that's, uh, it's the, 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 the big line that you have on the graphic. I don't know why it is shown as plain, but it's the, 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 the one at the, at the extreme uh, high. With that dotted line, it shows that renewable energy may reach 10% of, of the world energy demand by 2035. In less than 30 years from the point, it provided 1% of world energy. And in, if that's the case, if we just extrapolate that trend, uh, it, would, it means that renewable energy would have penetrated the, the energy system more quickly than any other fuel in history. And even then, even that ten, with that 10%, if you reach that 10% of renewable energy, you still need 90, you have still 90% to cover. 90% uh, of the world energy needs will need to come from other fuels. My personal take from this graphic is slightly different, um, particularly if I isolate the two fastest growing technologies, renewable energy indeed, and nuclear. Uh, and I, the conclusion that I take from it, and that's a very quick conclusion that I'm sure Kasmin uh, will, will, will probably challenge, is that uh, impactful change really generally occur, I mean, in, in these two specific examples, first, when the debate has been depoliticized, aka nuclear, and when there is a combination of intensive R&D, government incentives, but also, of course, enabling market mechanisms, and I'm insisting on this one, and free trade. Only free trade enabled solar panels to move from one continent to the other, and re we reached the decreasing cost that we have witnessed in the last decade. The same dynamic is happening uh, at a slower pace, I must say, in other areas. And it is happening, and I think in this order, number one, in uh, energy batteries and storage, and we've discussed it last year, I think, extensively. It's also happening at a second, second in mobility, in the area of mobility, and also it's happening uh, third in uh, process and heavy industries that Tanaka-san has hint started hitting at in his presentation. But f here again, from an investor perspective, this lack of visibility on the sequencing is probably the first missing link that we have in our uh, climate change governance toolbox. So w w I think we need targeted instruments with uh, uh, optimal risk returns ratios for the various emitting sectors with various utilizations to really accelerate this transition. So the governments can guide the energy mix, the ensuing investments through their uh, toolkit of various policy mechanisms, but I think only institutional investors can help absorb the market risks, but also the technology risks that I'm, that I'm talking about here. So if we all agree that change is already happening at scale, I repeat that, uh, and that multiple solutions are required from an investor perspective, where should we invest? Uh, Vaclav Smil reminds us that basically, after we increased our energy and power density needs dramatically, we want now to find solutions to re totally reverse those past trends. I think uh, a simple way for those of us who, tho those of us in this room who are not er energy geeks like us, a simple way to say this is uh, basically to address the emissions in different utilizations, different technologies will be required. You will need solar PV, but you also need CSP. You will need solar PV, but you need some storage with it. Uh, you will need massive energy efficiency programs and heat recovery in the industrial sector. And you need obviously nuclear. And why I'm pointing at nuclear, because uh, you have uh, the, the, the wider electrification that we want in, in, in the economy, uh, and that's beyond EVs. I mean, I'm talking about edge, edge computing, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, smart homes, etc. That, at the end of the day, puts additional pressure on the utilities to decarbonize 
uh, first and to decarbonize faster. So uh, nuclear energy provided 4% of global energy in 2018. That's 2,700 terawatt hours. It hasn't grown sin since 2002. Uh, Kasmin, I'm, I would be more interested to hear your thoughts about where we stand on research and fusion efficient. I mean, is, is it going to really solve our problem from on the utilities side? But in terms of technologies, I... Um, there are a few counterintuitive trends that I want to highlight here, that which, has been, which have been really driving investments for more than a decade now. And, and when I say counterintuitive, it's really for anyone who believes today that investors are, all of them are deserting full of fossil fuels altogether. So the first, here again, counterintuitive trend is that we still have massive efforts and massive investments to recover more hydrocarbons in terms of production. We are trying as much as possible to optimize the efficient use of hydrocarbons produced, and a lot of money is going into that. A lot of money is going, especially in the, when we try to increase the focus on low-cost low fuels, but also low-carbon fuels. And the reason for that is very simple. Today, you have less than 20% of hydrocarbon molecules extracted from the Earth. That's oil, gas, and coal, of course, but less than 20% of that actually turns into useful end use, energy, plastics, etc. Only 20%. The rest is was wasted. So today, the industry has realized that, and there are tremendous efforts happen happening to restructure the business models and reward the optimizing an efficient few use of, uh, of, of fuels instead of rewarding uh, the volumes of hydrocarbon produced. So there are efforts, as you can see, of vertical integration at scale into refining, into petrochemicals by several large players. That's an, one example of these efforts. And uh, uh, I'll cite one last extreme example of the crude chemical scheme that uh, is uh, being looked at in Saudi Arabia. That, that the aim is really to reach 70% conversion rate from crude to plastics. Um, Second interesting dynamic is happening in mobility. And here uh, uh, I'll get into uh, uh, the internal combustion engine. So there are, again, massive R&D efforts and investments happening in the area of ultra-low emission fuels and, and engine technologies. So with that, you can assume that the internal com combustion engine can still enjoy a few years of monopoly in the transportation sector. But in parallel, there is a drive among uh, cities, among politicians, to ensure that transport prices are actually better reflecting externalities, internal costs, and other things. So to really have a view on the real cost of transportation, the real cost of urban and road transportation. So with the development of all those technology solutions that we see in, in Europe and, and US, etc., smart charging schemes, ride hailing, bike sharing, there are increasing calls, uh, especially among cities, for uh, the right pricing framework, a fair pricing framework for the use of public space by these charging stations, for the use of, for the utilization of commodities and the scarcity of resources that, are, that go into this, those technologies. And when you run the numbers, at the end of the day, you, you find that liquid fuels are, might be actually the winners from these all, let's all cost in everything approaches. And uh, I'm just saying. Uh, third point, uh, in addition to solar and wind and, and storage in its different forms, and I think we discussed it extensively last year, but here again, I want to highlight in a context of continuously this decreasing costs in storage as well, uh, the uncertainties about which technology will win, will win. I mean, uh, beyond lithium ion and uh, redox flow batteries, Concerns about the commodities uh, that are being mined in, in, in tricky places in Africa needed for specific storage technologies. And even when regulators show enough, I would say, creativity to reward flexibility, uh, investors remain concerned. They remain very concerned and wary, again, of, of regret costs in those technologies. So a couple of points to conclude. What is left for governments to do? I think, uh, and that, comes, that came today in the discussion between uh, Patrick Poyanné and Laurent Fabius, May, uh, but uh, we organized at Apicorp uh, a recent strategic industry roundtable where we brought 
people from the energy sector and the financing uh, community together in a single room under Shatam House rule to uh, address the question of um, what are the instruments that are needed to accelerate the energy transition. And, um, and, and yeah, these two communities don't really talk to each other most of the time, so that's why we thought it would be interesting to bring them together. Uh, and the, the very first recommendation that came up was uh, the need to formalize a price on carbon, any price, but just formalize a price on carbon. That's, that was considered as the single most effective mechanism to really enable a level playing fields between the different technologies and the consumer's choices. But the problem is, in the absence of carbon trading mechanisms, and I'm here thinking outside of Europe and, and some other places, um, what is being proposed, for example, in the American Green New Deal, when we start estimating the social cost of carbons, it's ended up producing ridicul ridiculously wide ranges. So when we leave it to the economists, uh, we ended up having very complex calculations when it comes to carbon prices. So and even if carbon taxes should, be in, in theory, be an easy form of, of, of carbon pricing. So the cal I agree the calculation is complex. I agree uh, non-marginal changes related to climate change have to be factored in. I agree the tax has to be revenue neutral, but the first steps are required, and you hear that from both communities alike and from the government as well. What is left for companies to do, and I'll finish with that, um, these two graphics that I'm showing on my slide really summarize, I think, the dilemma facing the energy sector. On, on I think, the left-hand side, uh, uh, you can see it's, the energy sector is one of the sectors that provided the lowest returns to shareholders during the last decade just among the S&P 500. It's a fraction of what IT or real estate have provided. The energy sector is really today competing with other sectors that are deemed much more attractive for, for, for investors in terms of returns. And, and, th and the problem is that the gap is really wide, as you can see. Uh, energy provides less than 10% of return, while IT or consumers have provided more than 300% over a decade. And the other problem is that in terms of valuation, some parts of, of, of the energy sector seem undervalued I'm mainly talking about the upstream side of it, but there's always that persistent fear of stranded assets uh, because we don't have the clarity over, over, over the climate change trajectory. And on the other side, in the right-hand side, you can see that in parallel, returns are also being squeezed in the different parts of the value chain. I took here the example of the gas sector, uh, but the same is true across the board. So if, if, if they really want to survive through the energy transitions and continue to provide an, active, uh, an attractive value propositions for the investors, energy companies have no other choice than to embark on vertical integration at scale. And that's not only, that's not only vertical integration as in the past to stabilize the earning by, uh, by benefiting from the country cyclical uh, uh, profits in upstream and downstream. That's really also to maximize the margins across the value chain. And on top of that, in the national oil companies particularly, the 80% the production that uh, Patrick Poyene was referring to earlier today, they are directed, they are instructed to extract additional value from the sovereign uh, and finite oil and gas resources. Um, so for corporate strategies, I would say that a low carbon world is retranslating really into more integration, more scale, more optimization, and uh, then I would just like to remind everyone that the journey of integration is really a marriage between two different business models, two different operating cultures, returns, expectations, and time horizon. And so why I'm saying that is that after the integrated management of, of this different segment of the value chain, the next step might be to seek, it is actually to seek growth by optimizing the balance sheet even further, and that's the pressure that we are having also in, in, in terms of financing the energy sector. So in, in some areas, I mean, US Shell benefited, as you all know, partly from, from long-term commitments from private equities. Uh, if, if you start considering oil and gas resources as just any other investment asset class, the same could happen at a larger scale between large and oil energy companies and investment funds. Um, so what type of industry structure will we get in that drive for, for low carbon world? But I would like to finish on a, oh, I didn't have it here, but I had, a, I had a nice slide showing that after all, within the infrastructure 
sector, uh, the energy sector, remains the preferred industry for institutional investors. And I'll finish with that. Okay, thank you very much, Leila. Um, yeah, I cannot agree more that government should do the carbon price or carbon tax to, to give the clear message to the business sector. Unfortunately, the discussion more than decades didn't lead us to the, any official carbon price or carbon tax. That, that's a problem. It's, it's definitely the best way to reduce carbon, but unfortunately it didn't happen. So in a way, for the green financing, as you say, one of the criteria for the investors is does corporation have the internal carbon pricing for the decision of the investment? And that is happening. I mean, TCFD, uh, Task Force for Climate, I mean, D Financial Risk Disclosure, certainly internal carbon pricing is one of the things they request. And many major oil company like uh, Total, BP, Shell, they are the member signatory to the TCFD and doing even, uh, of course, are they, this, this internal carbon pricing is uh, really uh, ambitious enough. That's a question. But uh, 40, 50, 60 dollars are set. And uh, in, uh, in, the, in the interesting discussion in ISEF in, in Japan was that uh, last year, exactly the same time, uh, the ISEF meeting, I talk, uh, I raised the issue of internal carbon pricing by saying there is only one or two Japanese companies who had the internal carbon price at that time. Now, uh, the CDP representative told me in, in the public discussion that there are 70, 70 companies in Japan has now the internal carbon price. So this is a huge difference because, uh, as I said, 200 Japanese corporations are now signatory to TCFD. So TCFD means they should have a kind of energy scenario for the future. Otherwise, they can, uh, well, sustainability scenario definitely contain, uh, include the carbon pricing. So eventually, this kind of pressure from the financial sector for requesting disclosure will lead the corporations to what uh, is desirable in terms of the carbon pricing. That is my observation. Do you think so? Or, or, uh? Yeah, I fully agree. I and mean, all the models that I've seen uh, in, in various, uh, I would say, energy companies, international and national, uh, you basically have three main frames. You always have a cell with carbon pricing on it. Whether you, you, you fill it or not, that's another question. But conceptually, you have usually two main methodologies. You, I mean, you either just follow blindly what you have in the ETS uh, and... and uh, thanks to Europe, provided a, a sort of framework for 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 a, for a carbon price that can be used in other areas of the world. Here again, conceptually, or as you as you mentioned, you can just decide to have a flat what you think is an assumption for for future pricing, and that and that's the reason why at the end of the day we end up uh, having that focus that I mentioned on not only low costs fuels and hydrocarbon, but also low low carbon. Uh, crudes and hydrocarbons. So that's uh, that's not that's not an that's not an idea that just came up yesterday. It's it, I mean I think the major oil and gas producers have been working on that for the last decade or so. But at the end of the day, I think people like to think of the a idea of carbon and uh, other fuels as a stock as well. So uh, you that that's a stock, and you need to just put a price on it. And uh, when you decide to deplete that stock today or in 30 years' time, uh, that's uh, that's 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 an assumption that you have to make. But I, I totally agree that every most energy companies today have carbon pricing assumption. Thank you very much, Leila. One additional question to you is that: What do you think about this climate change and gender? <laughs> Last year it was, what do you think about climate change in Saudi Arabia? <laughs> this year is what do you think about climate change and gender? Um, well, not, not much. I, I don't feel like an expert in the area, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I'll leave it to my male colleagues to comment on it. 